Are you in Sydney? I am in Sydney. And yeah. um, Jeremy Badesso, um let's talk. Let, let's not bury the lead because um, you, you brought him back to life. Um, what was it like bringing Jon Snow back from the dead? It was kind of great. It was um, the lead up to it was crazy because it was like the, the biggest secret on the planet, it seemed like. And, uh, you know, the speculation about whether he was dead or not dead or what was going to happen to him was like enormous. And uh, yeah, so the lead up to it was very exciting. And then actually executing it was very exciting because we, you know, really wanted it to be a big moment. We knew there was a huge amount of anticipation for it. And, um, you know, I think our goal was to really like keep a certain amount of suspense all the way until the end. So the audience wouldn't really know if he was going to, uh, if he was going to be reborn or not. And uh, uh, it was a, it was a very fun scene to work on and a really exciting thing to plan. How did you, uh, how did you find that whole speculation, like on the back end of the cliffhanger last season or the, not the cliffhanger, the him dying last season? Um, yeah. Because there were so many people that were saying, oh, well, I don't believe he's dead. There's no way he's dead. There's other people going, well, he's dead. And like all this sort of people like me annoying you, asking you in interviews what the st story is. Like what was that like having to deal with all that sort of hype? Was that exciting? Was it frustrating? It was really exciting. And I think anything that hits the, the sort of public consciousness in that way and that, you know, has so many people excited and invested in it, it's like it's really almost unbelievable. Like, we all knew the show was popular and had fans and all this kind of things, but unless you're at the center of that whole thing, you don't really realize like how massive a phenomenon the show really is. And for me, like it was like a new level of awareness of what the show means to people. And that was very exciting. I, I expected like, a certain amount of speculation, but not like that. I mean, it was really huge. I couldn't have a conversation with anybody for months that didn't, you know, that wasn't around like, is he dead or is he alive? You know, obviously I couldn't tell anybody anything, even the people closest to me. So it was weird to have this like <laughs> bit of information, you know, that I couldn't share with anyone on the planet at all. Um, but it was, uh, it was, it was fascinating to be at the center of all that. I was, I really found that an amazing you know, tribute to the show and then its popularity that there was so much fascination with that whole idea. So yeah, no, I, I kind of loved being in the center of it. It was frustrating that I couldn't tell anybody, but it was amazing to kind of be in the middle of that little storm. Mm. So you went like, oh, why is everyone just saying he's back to life? They're not going to be a surprise when it happens. Nobody, so the great thing is that nobody really wanted to know. That was, that's the cool mm. thing. Like everybody thinks they want to know, but they don't really. They love the kind of, you know, the tension yeah. and, and suspense and all that stuff. Yeah. And um, did the speculation and that whole hype around it inform any of the choices you made as a director in how to present it? Um, yeah, in some ways. Uh, like I said, I think I really wanted to honor the mis the mystery of it all and honor the time that people had spent kind of like thinking about it and speculating and worrying about it and all those things. And so you don't want it to be like a cheap moment, like when the reveal actually happens. You want it to be like a really meaningful and hopefully moving moment for people that's satisfying that like after all that time when it finally happens that people will be like, oh my God, you know, I, either I didn't see that coming or not in that way or... So just that somehow dramatically it, it really pays off. And, um, and I, I think we did that. I think people seemed really happy with the episode and I, w I was really pleased. And that, and, but it, you know, definitely it affected how we shot the whole thing and how we cut it and you know, wanting it to be like a very powerful and moving moment. Now, I know last season you delved in this, ter the season before you delved in this territory a little bit, but we're really in sort of uncharted waters in terms of Game of Thrones with the books having been finished, uh, not finished, but we're, we're like Jon Snow came back to life was not something that was in the books. That was something you guys um, uh, had to sort of do on your own. What is it like as a director approaching the scenes where there isn't a book to look at or to read through to get some sort of idea on themes and stuff like that. Is there a difference as how you approach it? Not so much. I mean, in the past, you know, I've been aware of things in the book and how they differ from the show. But I mean, the divergence has been happening for quite a while already. And, you know, the, the series has never been really slavish to the book. So I think that, um, you know, nothing really changes that much in terms of how I approach it. I think it was liberating for the writers in a way that they weren't married to anything and they could really kind of you know, take the story wherever they wanted to take it, whatever felt organic to them is where they went. And, um, but for me, it's exciting because, you know, reading the scripts, I, I didn't know where anything was going to go for the, you know, the first time I looked at the material. 
And so that was, uh, that's always exciting just to see the choices that the writers make when they're completely free to do whatever they want to do. Um, but in terms of my work, you know, my work has always been about just interpreting the script. You know, it's not about, for me either, being slavish to the books. It's just using the book sometimes as a support or a help or an explanation for things. But, you know, my, my job is always to really make the scripts come to life. And, um, you know, so that doesn't really change. When were you told that Jon Snow is coming back to life? And when were you told that you'd be directing that episode? Um, I think I was told that I was going to be directing the first two episodes before I'd read or seen anything. So I didn't really know what was going to happen in those two episodes. I knew obviously that the subject was going to be dealt with one way or another, that he was really going to be dead or not dead, <laughs> or, you know, something was going to transpire probably in the first couple episodes, but I didn't know what. Um, so I was just very happy to direct the first two because, you know, I knew that coming back into the season, there was going to be so much excitement about, you know, where we were going to take everything. Um, and then I think I saw probably an outline first for the season before I read the scripts. I don't think the scripts were available exactly at the time when I was hired to rehired to do it. So when I read the outline, you know, the cat was out of the bag at that point, and I kind of knew what was going to happen. Um, and it was very exciting to see that. Actually, what was very interesting to me was that they didn't bring him back to life in the first episode. And uh, so that they waited until the second to do that, I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. So they're really kind of giving us a little bit more time, creating more kind of speculation. And uh, I thought in the end, I thought that was a really smart move to not do everything in the first episode to leave something for the next one, which was exciting. And actually a lot of stuff happens in those two episodes. So it was, they were pretty jam packed. It was, I loved the resolution of the Jon Snow thing, but I loved a lot of the other things that were going on too. It was great. Something I find hard with Game of Thrones sometimes is to get a sense of time uh, because there's so many different storylines having to like jumping back and forth between different things. How long was Jon Snow dead for? Not long. I, I think what was really cool about the beginning of the season is that it starts like almost immediately after the, the end of last season. And in some ways, you know, it's good for a lot of different reasons. But one big thing is that, you know, very often first first episodes in series that, you know, that go on will be like, you know, reminding the audience of what happened before and then laying track for what's going to come after. And with this season, it was very different. It was like we start, you know, maybe a couple of hours later. They have Jon Snow still in the snow where they where he was stabbed. Um, you know, there's more blood around him, but you know, it's, we're, we're really, it's the same evening a few hours later. And, um, so we're really picking things up like really very, very quickly and there's no time passed. And, you know, it's, uh, to me, I think that was the most energetic way to get into the season where, you know, everybody's exactly where we left them and we just pick up the story immediately. It's like no time has gone by. So I, I love that. Mm. Is in Game of Thrones, like, all the storylines happening at a similar pace? Like, is that a hard thing for you to sort of juggle all those different storylines and sort of, like, the in your two episodes, maybe Jon Snow and what's happening at the Wall is, like, a day or two, but what's happening in Marine could be, like, a week's worth of time? Like, is that a sort of hard thing to get your head around? Well, I don't really think about it that much, actually. Like, it's, it, it is true. There's a kind of weird fluidity of time sometimes, like where, yes, it, certainly some things, you know, if somebody's traveling a great distance, you know, they happen to be there in a the space that it's like a, you know, a day in some other storyline. But it's, um, I think it's something that the audience just accepts. It's a, it's a little bit of like, um, um, I don't know what you call it exactly, but it's, a, it's a, a trope of the show in a way that, you know, time is a little bit malleable. And so uh, I think you, it's very intuitive in a way with the way they write it. Like they take you to the points where you want to be intuitively in mm. terms of storytelling, but not necessarily in terms of real time. So, you know, you don't really want to see, you know, Daenerys traveling across countryside for like, you know, 10 days, you know, to get somewhere, which probably would be to get from one place to another in this Dothraki sea. But, um, you know, it's, so she's just there in the space of like a day or something, but it's, I think it's okay. Like it just, you accept a certain amount of, you know, flexibility with all these things and, and everything feels organic. You never feel like, hey, wait a minute, what about this or that? It's, everything just kind of flows, I think, in a way that it feels very natural. So the audience mm -hmm. definitely has learned to accept all that kind of time fudging. Yeah. And when the storylines meet up, it makes sense. Like whenever, the, whenever they overlap or cross paths, you yeah. know. Yeah, and it, it always feels right. I mean, I think that is the most important thing with TV and you know film in general is that it's not so much about being 
you know, pedantic about things and things being like super accurate in every aspect. It's really just how it feels. And it's, you know, the storytelling has to feel right and the timing has to feel right. And, you know, if you have that kind of innate sense of, you know, uh, you know, good storytelling, then that you can forgive a lot of other, you know, detail kind of stuff. Is, is it hard, like, is one drawback of directing, like, a moment as big as the Jon Snow resurrection scene, is that there is so much focus on that moment that sort of other sort of parts of that episode or the story or what you're directing sort of go unnoticed and are sort of overshadowed by that? I think, you know, it could be the case if the writing wasn't as good as it actually is and if the cast wasn't as great as they actually are. And so I think, you know, even though there's an enormous amount of speculation about the Jon Snow thing, I think, you know, seeing what happened to Cersei after the Walk of Shame and seeing, you know, what happened to Danny after she's captured by the Dothraki and like, oh, there's, there's so many different things going on that are really interesting and that also have an incredible amount of cinematic scope. So you have like these new worlds and new places to see and you have, um, you know, characters that we're all invested in for for a lot of reasons, not just Jon Snow. And we're picking them up in very dramatic points in their lives. So I feel like the episodes really were strong, you know, from every point of view, not just in the Jon Snow thing, but there was so much going on and they're very full and very rich and very dramatic. And, you know, the actors did a fantastic work. So I think if it was really all about and only about Jon Snow, I don't think the episodes would be as satisfying. They have to kind of work on every level. Every storyline has to be satisfying. And I, I think they were, they were written so well that you know, I think the fans really responded to them. And I, like, I'm just very conscious that like you directed two hours of Game of Thrones this year, and I've uh, I've spent ten minutes asking you about five minutes of those <laughs> two hours. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that does happen sometimes when something becomes like a thing. But you know, I loved you know Tyrion meeting the dragons for the first time. You know, something that he'd dreamed about his entire life and had been fascinated with since he was a kid. And then there's this great scene that we had with him and interacting with the dragons. And you know, there's so many things. I think if people are real aficionados of the show and you really appreciate, they, they appreciate all those things. Like they're really, you know, they're not only interested in Jon Snow. I think they're interested in everything. Yeah, and I'd say that's probably like Tyrion's strongest moment of the season almost, that scene with the dragons and that sort of monologue he gets to do. What's it like when you get to shoot a scene like that, which isn't about a big moment like someone coming back to life or a character death but just a real a moment where you just explore that character and uh, get to sort of like hear a bit about his motivations and his stories and how he's feeling oh it's great i mean when i get that on the page i'm really excited because i know peter is such a fantastic actor and he's going to really make something of that scene and you know and there's a you know all the scenes of the dragons have a kind of majesty and beauty to them and then but this one was so intimate and interesting and it, and we've known for a long time that Tyrion's been fascinated by these things. And so for him to have this kind of very close encounter with the dragons, you know, was going to be like a big moment. And then, you know, shooting it, because Peter is so great, you know, he made it even more moving than I expected it to be. Like, I thought it was going to be a really beautiful scene, but I got really kind of choked up, you know, when we were filming it, because, you know, he, all that emotional stuff really came through in a very strong way. So it was great. It was really, really a fun scene to do. And those things, you know, when you're doing dragons and there's so much of visual effects and things, it can become a little bit mechanical because everything's storyboarded and you have to do things in a certain way. And, you know, it has to kind of, you know, work from a technical point of view. But I think what's so great is when you get, you know, really well-written script and you get a, an actor as good as Peter in there, suddenly it's not about all that stuff at all when you're filming it. It's really just about a, an emotional thing. And that, and that just elevates it completely. Last night when I was watching the big, uh, the battle with the dragons and Daenerys in, in Marine, uh, like it did, and Tyrion's there, it did remind me of that scene you directed um, where you, you sort of go, boy, and it reminded me of like from a couple of seasons ago where, you know, Tyrion's sharing about his childhood and growing up and not being, you know, you know, I, I think particularly when he, uh, the Viper was talking about seeing Tyrion as a baby and, like, it just made me watching that scene yesterday remember that scene you directed and go, oh, like, he's growing up to see dragons. Yeah. Not to see dragons, but see them in action and be part of, like, some movie. Like, it's just, what is it like for you watching the episodes after the ones you've directed and seeing sort of the links to things you've addressed and themes and stuff like that? 
Oh, it's great. I love it. I mean, I, I watch like a audience member, like anyone really in a way. Uh, I'm super invested in the show as a viewer. So I get very excited by watching the new episodes. And, you know, I've, I've read all the scripts. So for me, seeing them fully realized is, it's very exciting. Um, and I'm just so impressed with the work of my colleagues. <laughs> you know, they, everybody does such an incredible job and it's amazing just to see how stuff comes to life. It's, it's something. Do you watch it a bit like differently from a viewer in the sense that like you might be watching last night's episode or another episode and going, oh yeah, that, that oh, hopefully I get to work with that person next, next year. And I'll like, oh yeah, that'd be a good, like, you know, way to do like, does it, does it watching it inform the way you think about directing it when you're coming back for an, another season? Oh yeah, I think so. I think we all learn from each other. I mean, doing a show like this is so complicated and you know, it's just great to see how other directors approach things and, you know, what they, what they, you know, what kind of a meal they make out of everything. And especially because I've read everything on the page, it's always a surprise to me, the choices that different directors make and the kind of um, solutions they find to problems. And, you know, nobody knows how difficult this show is more than a director on the show. Like we were all in this together and I, I so appreciate the challenges that all the, the directors face, not just me in terms of, you know, making the thing come to life. These scripts are so dense and really complex. We're shooting in many countries and, you know, it's a, there's a lot going on logistically. And, um, you know, when I see what everybody's done, of course, it's enormously helpful for me going into it. And, um, you know, I'm going back again next season and, you know, just seeing how everything's done, you know, through this season, it's, uh, you know, it's vitally important, you know, to see uh, how everybody, you know, cracks the, the problem of the show in a way and the kind of rich things that they create out of it. Can, can you tell us like how many episodes you're directing next season and what episodes they are or not? I cannot. Oh, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, I could, but it wouldn't be the right thing to do. So okay, that's fine. <laughs> I think at some point they're going to make an announcement about how many yeah. directors and who's doing what and all that. But um, yeah, it'll be good. Because this season you had five directors, they each did two back-to-back -back episodes, and um, I, I, I'm not sure if that was that a new way of doing it for the series. Uh, no, for a few seasons it's been that way, yeah. where uh, everyone does a block of two episodes that are consecutive. Next season will be different because it's already been announced that there's seven episodes, so as opposed to ten, so it's not an even number. So things will shake down a little bit differently. Yeah. No, and that must work with so many different storylines and locations. It must just make sense to do two back to back. It really does. I mean, then it's like you're doing a two hour movie basically. And, mm -hmm. um, and that you can really sink your teeth into. And I think if they had, you know, 10 directors doing 10 episodes, it would just be like a nightmare really. Um, but, uh, you know, with five people, it's, it's a controllable amount of work for each director and it's a controllable number of directors. And that seems to work pretty well. In your two episodes you directed this season, what's a choice you had to make as director that you're particularly fond of? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, oh God, there's so many. Uh, you can say more than one if you would like, Jeremy. Oh God, I have to think back. Um, I think, uh, you know, there was, you know, one of the very challenging sequences was actually when the wildlings come into Castle Black with the win-win and they, you know, crashing through the doors and. Um, you know, there's just so much going on in that sequence and, uh, you know, I'm quite, quite, quite proud of how we planned it and shot it. And, you know, I think there was some, a lot of great work. Again, all the actors were doing fantastic things and there's, you know, that was a really fun scene to do. Um, ah, oh God, I don't know. There were, there's a lot. Yeah. Did, um, is there been from the other episodes you've seen any moments which you've thought, oh boy, that was so well shot or tracked or what? Like something just from, especially from the mind of a director of the show, something that you sort of thought, oh, I wouldn't have thought about doing it that way. Well, I mean, I think you know the the most recent episode that aired, the um, the Battle of the Bastards. I think Miguel Sapochnik did like an unbelievably amazing job with that. And that was, you know, again, I'd read that script and, you know, when I read it, I was like, oh my God, this, this is big. And, you know, he had done Hard Home last season, which was amazing. And, you know, but this was even a, even greater challenge, I think. And just, you know, to see how he interpreted that script and, you know, there's always in these kind of things, especially with action sequences, there's so much that's kind of not written. It's like, it's textural and it's, 
you know, mechanical, you have to figure out as a director, well, exactly how is this military operation working? And where is, where are all these people in relation to each other? And like, there's a lot of stuff you have to really figure out. It's not all on the page. And, you know, he did such an amazing job of not just, you know, making sense of this very complex kind of sequence, but also making it very strong from a kind of character's point of view. So it's really Jon Snow's experience of being in the middle of this melee and, you know, all this, you know, horrible stuff happening around him. And it's like, it, it always, I think, with action sequences, having a point of view is so critical, you know, rather than just being mayhem and chaos and, you know, people flying around. It's, you know, you, you really have a very, very strong sense of what it is like to be at the center of this and, you know, and to, and to be with Jon Snow in this, you know, terrible, you know, cataclysmic kind of moment. And, you know, I just thought it was so beautifully rendered. It was so artful and, you know, and exciting and horrifying and, you know, all those things. It was, it was beautiful. Hmm. I imagine you, not just as a director, but as a viewer of the show, get quite invested in the characters. Um, yes, very. <laughs> yeah. Is that... I, I think that's why people watch the show. I mean, as much as there's spectacle and myth and, you know, and, you know, great themes and all that, it, it, if it didn't have like characters that you really, really cared about, there's no show, you know? And I think, you know, the actors are so beautifully cast and, you know, the story arcs that they create for them are so incredible that it's, yes, I mean, I'm like everybody, I get so invested in, you know, what everybody's going through. Who, who would you like to see on the Iron Throne of all the characters? Hmm. It's a very good question. Um, I don't know. Like I, it keeps changing in my mind actually. Like, Sometimes I think it would be incredible to see Sansa on the throne. It would be incredible to see Danny, John. Uh, I think a woman, actually, I would have to say probably would be the most exciting thing to see. Women should rule the world, after all. And, um, and there's a lot of really powerful women in the show. So, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see one of the Stark girls, probably, if, I'm, if, if you force me to give an answer. I think especially, like, when the show started, maybe among some circles, some people, there was a bit of, like, I know, controversy about the nudity and the sex and stuff. As always, like, I think as most HBO shows have. But what I've really thought has been impressive about Game of Thrones is the strong female characters mm -hmm. you guys have presented yeah. on the show. And, I, like, and I, I, it's probably a bit unfair to some of the guys on the show, but every year when I'm going through which sort of performances on Game of Thrones I'm most impressed by... There's so many women that are at the top of that list every season. Yeah, I think you know? increasingly it's become all about the ladies in a way. Like it's, you know, the women are, you know, the, well, actually interestingly, because like, you know, the uh, Maisie who plays Arya and Sophie who plays Sansa, like they, they were kids when the show started, but now they've become, you know, very strong, powerful, you know, actresses and, and characters, strong women. And, um, so there's, you know, kind of as, as they've grown up in the show, the, the women, the, the position of the women has become even stronger. And so I think, and I think the writer's been writing to that, you know, incredibly well. And um, yeah, so it feels, it feels like it's a woman's world, you know, going forward. And, and that's pretty exciting. I think there's more like women on TV, strong women roles on TV now than maybe there's been in a long time or maybe ever. But Game of Thrones in particular, I think, is a show that has had like y y there aren't many other shows that have as many strong, complex, rich female characters. I don't think. And well, but I don't, I don't think many either. it's an, it's, I think it's a real tribute to the writer that they do an incredible job with that. Um, you know, I think it, like a character like Brienne of Tarth, you know, she's, mm. she's a warrior as far as the most interesting warrior in the entire show. And she's a woman and an amazing character. Um, you know, Cersei, really complicated character, lover, hater, you know, but very strong, very powerful. Yeah, I think, like, right across the board, there's been some amazing people, amazing women. Uh, Ma Maisie Williams knocked it out of the park last week as well. Oh, my God, she's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, do, do you have a character, who, which character do you hate the most on Game of Thrones? Well... I mean, Ramsey was pretty bad. Yeah, <laughs> Ramsey or Joffrey? Who was worse? Uh, I'm going to go with Ramsey. I think there was like a level of sadism in, in him that was like, you know, even Joffrey didn't quite have that. And uh, I mean, the irony is that, that Ewan who plays Ramsey is like the nicest guy on the planet. 
<laughs> so it's like I, it's my vision of that character is always tempered by by knowing the actor who's like the sweetest, most lovely, you know, wouldn't hurt a fly guy ever. So I, you know, it, it's hard for me to completely see Ramsey as that horrible, you know, creature that everybody sees him at. But but you know, if I just look at the character as a character, yes, I think he's done the most despicable things probably of anybody on the show ever. And you probably directed the most despicable things. He, yeah, if you were some yeah. He did, he did a lot of bad things though, so, you know. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, but you know, he got what's, what was coming to him. Yeah, boy, that was, <laughs> was that satisfying for you to watch last night after uh, um, having to sort of be so close to sort of, um, sort of the real, the real bit where he just became completely irredeemable in the eyes of probably most of the audience of the show? Well, I think, you know, what made it satisfying for everybody was, you know, it was really Sansa's revenge, you know, and I think that, you know, it's, yes, the character, you know, met an end that he deserved, but it was also who, who meted out that revenge. It was really Sansa. And I think that's what made that really a powerful moment and, which is, and really satisfying. Yeah, which is rare in Game of Thrones. You know, you have Joffrey dying at the Purple Wedding, not at the hands of, Arya Stark or anything like that sort of uh -huh. like so it, like it, that was sort of a moment that we haven't seen heaps of in Game of Thrones we've seen bad guys get the comeuppance but not always at the hands of the um, yeah, person they wronged. it's mm -hmm. true and, and this was a really good one I think like if there was ever going to be one of those situations where you wanted to see somebody actually get the revenge that they should get this was the one that you wanted to see and um, yeah, I thought it was great, and they, they played it really well. It was a horrifying sequence. Yeah. And uh, what was it like last year? You guys won Best Drama Series at the Emmys. You didn't just win Best Drama Series, though. You broke the record for most Emmy wins in a season by any show, overtaking the West Wing's uh, record of nine. How did that feel to make Emmy history and just to win Drama Series, too? Oh, I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. And I, I was like so happy for Dan and David who created the show and happy for everybody. It was, it was just, um, I, I would say it was like, it's a vindication in a way, but I, it's maybe the wrong word because I think the unfortunate thing is that shows that are deemed the genre shows, you know, in a way are often kind of not given the, the credit for the craft and skill involved in making them that they deserve. And I think, with what Game of Thrones is, is, it's so out of beyond any category, really. And I was really happy that it was recognized in that way that, that people didn't pigeonhole it as as that kind of a thing. They just saw, they just recognized it as a great show. Period. No matter what the genre is, and you know, a, a show that's beautifully made, beautifully directed, beautifully acted, beautifully written. You know, on a production level, I don't think there's anything else like it on television. It's you know, it's unparalleled. I think in the in the quality of the overall work by every single person involved. It's just everyone's so at the top of their game on the show. And um, and I think, you know, year after year, the show has just been working at such a high level. So it was so great that at this point, you know, in the fifth season, you know, when, when many shows are taken for granted, that the show wasn't. That, it, you know, finally in the season five was recognized for the incredible work that it does. And, you know, and, you know, I, I couldn't appreciate more the, you know, the work that everybody does on the show. I mean, people are just freaking amazing on the show. They, they do such great work. Yeah, it's interesting. The Emmys have an interesting history of fifth seasons of shows because The Sopranos, 24, and Breaking Bad all won their first Emmys in their fifth season. Oh, really? I didn't realize that, actually. That's interesting. Yeah, for drama series, yeah. And it's an exclusive oh. club because in the past um, 18 years, you were the ninth show to have won Best Drama Series. Say that again? Oh, oh right. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, just... only nine dramas have won that award in the uh -huh. past 18 years, and you're one of them. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. No, yeah. I couldn't have been happier. That night, I was just high the entire night. It was really fantastic. I, I just was so happy for everyone to get the credit that they, I really deeply feel that they deserved for the show. So that was you know, people work so hard on the show and they do such beautiful work. It was, it was a great thing to see. Were you, were you aware of the record and how many you needed to win to beat no. West Wing that night? No, <laughs> no, I'm not a number counter. Yeah. So, at, Go <laughs> at Gold Derby, we were very conscious. We were. As you would be. Yeah. Yeah. 
We thought if they, if they, I think you need to win two on the night. So like if they, we thought you were front runners for drama series and we thought, well, if they win drama series and nothing else, well, then they don't beat the record. But if they win drama series and something else, they've got it. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it was it was a big night for everyone. It was a great night. And, um, yeah, that must have been uh, pretty exciting. You didn't win directing, but your show did win directing. So that must have been cool. Oh, yeah, it was great. No, I was just happy to be at the party. You know, it was, it was great to be at the Emmys, to be nominated. It was, it was, uh, it couldn't have been better. It was great. Hmm. And um, I guess, like, looking forward to, uh, what, what's your favourite episode of Game of Thrones over the course of the series? Favourite to watch as a viewer? I'm going to uh, say favourite to watch and favourite to direct. Hmm, interesting. Um, God, I don't know. Uh, favourite to watch? There are so many. Uh, hmm. I don't know. I, I really can't say with favorite to watch because I like, <laughs> I, you know, I watch each episode really eagerly. And like, I mean, of course there's like the huge episodes like the red wedding and there's like, you know, hard home. And there's these episodes that have been really impactful. But I think, you know, sometimes for me, like what I just love is like, there could be like a little scene with two people talking and it's just written so well and acted so well that I just like, I realized like, Oh God, I just love this show. Like I love that it takes these moments. You know, you can sit down and have like two people talking for five minutes about something and it's riveting. And just because the actors are so much fun to watch, it's, um, you know, that can really like make a show for me. And I, so like, you know, I, I've loved many, many, many episodes for so many reasons. And in terms of the ones that I directed, I guess probably, you know, Jon Snow coming back to life, that episode, the second episode from the last, from this current season was, was probably the, you know, I think, partly because of the anticipation around it and we were breaking such a big story point, but also there were so many things going on in that episode that were of interest. And I, I think everybody just did beautiful work and, you know, it just felt, it felt like a really, when I watched that episode for the first time after we edited it and we like, sat in the cutting room and watched the whole thing before I delivered it to the producers, I was like, holy moly, this is like, it's really good. <laughs> I, it just, there's so much going on in it. It was like, to me, it was a very, very satisfying episode to watch. I think what you say about the little moments, like the season that highlight that particularly well is maybe the season you had Aria and the Hound on the mm-hmm. road together. Yeah, exactly. And just exactly. those nice conversations were sometimes just highlights of the, the, maybe my favorite bits of those episodes. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. That, that is a very good example of that. Where just seeing these two actors work together and have such amazing chemistry. The, you know, it's, you know, you don't need always like a big kind of light show. It's sometimes just these little things can be really, Really, really satisfying. It was a good mix that that arc of uh, tension and comedy. Mm-hmm. With some yeah, really that's funny that's lines, that's but some yeah. It was interesting yeah. last night. We had a, there was a screening in Los Angeles at the Ace Hotel Theater of Episode Nine. Um, that was a for your consideration screening for mm-hmm. um, for yeah, voting members. Sense. And uh, it was so fun to see the show with a huge audience because people were laughing and they were you know, clapping and it was like, you know, and actually we'd had a premiere too with my first episode this season too at a man's Chinese theater in Hollywood, which was also amazing. Anytime you see the show with an audience, you really get that sense of like how that, how successfully the show does that with the humor and the action and everything. It just kind of works on so many levels, but the humor really lands like, you know, all that, the performances are so great and the writing is really strong, obviously. So yeah, I mean, all that stuff just with an audience plays incredibly well. It's a shame that you didn't have an episode screening for any episodes with Lady Elena in. Uh, she gets a big laugh every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's good. What, um, what's your favourite thing about Game of Thrones? Um, I think just, you know, working on the show... This, this always sounds like a bit Pollyannish when you say stuff like this, but it you know, really is like the nicest group of people that I've worked with, you know, maybe ever, you know, and definitely in the top few. Just, you know, it's such a lovely cast. The producers are so great. The crew is lovely. It's like, it, the, I mean, the best thing about doing the show is doing the show, you know, is making it, you know, and everybody's so good at what they do. Like the production designer is amazing. And the cinematography is amazing. And, 
you're just you're working with people who are great at what they do, and you're working on beautiful material. And you know what's not to like, you know. And we're you know we're shooting in Croatia and Spain and Northern Ireland and all these beautiful places. And you know it's it's a very challenging show to do for a lot of reasons. But you know you're working with such good people and on such good material that it's kind of a pleasure and a joy to do. So that's my favorite thing. You know, and then it's funny because when you're making the show, you're not so conscious of the public and the all the hoo ha around it, and it's really only at the premieres and things like that when you're like, oh wow, it's like, I mean, you know, it's a big deal, but you sort of forget about that because there's all these, you know, problems to fix and things to do, and you know, so it's you know the the later you think about, wow, how amazing it is to work on a show that has that kind of reach, that has that you know that audience is so enormous around the world, but you know. That's sort of secondary to the fact that actually making the show is so enjoyable for so many reasons. What's your favorite thing about the story? I think what's what's great about the story is well, there's a number of things. One is that it it allows even with all the stuff that's going on and the huge stakes and you know people fighting for epic things, it it still takes time for these like moments between characters that are really strong and intimate and powerful and you know and moving very often. Um, but it also has this incredible scope, you know, I think the storytelling, um, you know, on that cinematic level is very exciting in television and, um, and, you know, the scope also extends to the thematic, you know, things that it's dealing with it. It resonates, I think, you know, it talks about politics and power and, you know, choices people make in their lives and all these kind of things that are really universal and timeless. And, you know, the fact that it can touch on all these things. You know, you could find metaphors for what's happening in politics in the world, you know, all through the show, you know, things that are happening right now. And, you know, that's that's a very strong thing. Mm. Now, you, uh, as you said, you are working on season six at the moment. We, oh, no, season seven, sorry. Yeah. You're working on season yeah. seven at the moment. Um, you don't, um, you can't say too much about it, but I, I do have to ask, because you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you, might, you might be airing the premiere, that uh, you might be directing the premiere, um, which would be two episodes from the last episode, Jeremy. Is Rickon Stark dead? Is he going to be coming back? I, I can't answer any of those questions. <laughs> can't answer any of those questions. Is, is, <laughs> is, are we going to need to be on um, Art, uh, Art Parkington Watch um, for, for the summer to see if his hairdo changes and things like that? Uh, well, if, you, if that's how you want to spend your summer, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Th hey, Jerry, thanks so much for talking uh, to us uh, about Game awesome. of Thrones and directing it and all that sort of stuff. It's so cool to talk with you um, again this year. And uh, all the best for the Emmys. Thank Your you so episode much. is home that is on the ballots for directing at the moment. So um, that's one people can vote for. Thank you very much. No worries. Well, great to talk to you. Yeah, really good to talk to you.